Oh, so this arrived in the post some while ago, and you can see from it's the Nobel Committee for Physics and Chemistry, the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. And on the bottom you see it says 0144 out of 1,000. So I think I was number 144 on their list of 1,000 people they sent it out to. Secrecy requirements. You can read that. You should treat your invitation and nomination as highly confidential, so I'm not going to tell you who I voted for. It's one of those very closely guarded secrets, so nobody knows ahead of time. Lots of people try to predict it. Uh, they almost always get it completely wrong, uh, and this year is no exception. All the predictions were not the people who ended up winning the prize. So I believe there is a panel that decides it, um, and they actually send out letters. So I actually got a letter from the Nobel Foundation a year or so back, which you know, caused some excitement, because you don't get letters from the Nobel Foundation every day. But all they, they weren't saying, congratulations, you've won the prize. They just said, you know, do you have anyone you think who, who we should be considering? So they do go out and consult and find out what, you know, what the views are as the, the scientific community. I've been asked for some suggestions uh, and for some views in the past. And uh, I think what I've written down has to remain secret for 50 years, so I don't think I'm going to tell you much about that either. They're saying, who would you think in your professional experience is somebody who is deserving of a Nobel Prize for whatever reason, and then give your reasons and cite the most influential papers that lead you to do this, so that they have a, a, an accurate record of your opinion, which is meant to be independent of everybody else. And then you're giving the evidence so that, that you can make a case. And if enough people write in in support of somebody from all over the world, then that gets near the top of the list and then they make a, a decision. So today was the announcement of the Nobel Prize for Physics. Um, so over a series of a few days, the, the prizes for all the different areas that they actually give out Nobel Prizes in are announced. Um, so it's the physicist's turn today. So much excitement in the physics community to figure out who's won, who's now a million dollars better off. So it was actually split. It quite often is a, a split award and it was split two ways this time. Well, it's split between three people, but for two different things. So half of it went to a guy called George, uh, Charles Cow uh, for the invention of fiber optics, fiber optic technology. And the other half went to two physicists from the Bell Labs in the United States, William Boyle and George Smith, uh, for the invention of the CCD, the charge couple device. I mean, it, it's, a, I mean it's, it's strange because actually, you know, in some sense, I guess the pure physicists are a little frustrated because in some sense what's been given the prize here is a piece of technology, a piece of engineering. So it's, it's an interesting one, but it's um, perhaps a little bit unexpected in that um, I think quite a few people felt that the, the, the prize might go for a rather more fundamental discovery. There are, there are people who've done fantastic work in theoretical physics or in experimental work, but once in a while it's a good to, to remind the public that what we do is, uh, is a great practical use to the rest of the world. The, 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 the stuff that excites me is not so much the engineering side of physics, it's, it's really answering the big, deep, fundamental questions. And of course we need the technology to do that, but it's, you know, getting at the, the heart of matter, what, what, what is the, the structure of matter, what is the structure of the universe, um, fundamental quantum mechanical problems, fundamental basic physics, fundamental physics problems. Um, I guess that's what excites me. It doesn't excite, you know, that might excite other physicists rather less than it excites me. But that, I guess that's perhaps um, my take on it. I mean, fibre optics obviously has kind of revolutionised a lot of things in terms of broadband internet and, and, and cable television and so on, so it's been a huge impact on the world. Um, the other, the CCD, the charge couple device, has also actually had a huge impact in the world. The reason why you're able to film me at the moment is because you're using a camera with a CCD in the back. In fact, you know, all digital cameras use those uh, CCD devices. Um, and so it's really the, the device that allows you to store images digitally. Um, and obviously that has a huge impact in astronomy as well. Uh, in the old days, fortunately, just before I started in astronomy back in the 1980s, we used to record images on photographic plates. And so you can make nice pictures with photographic plates, but there's a couple of problems with them. Um, firstly, they're not very sensitive. Uh, they're about 1% as sensitive as a CCD is, so actually you have to observe the same thing for 100 times as long with a photographic plate. Um, but the other thing is that if you take a photographic plate, you end up with a photographic plate. And then there's not a whole lot you can do with it, really. I mean, you have to, you know, you can look at it, but that's about it. Whereas with a CCD, you end up with the information in a digital form. Um, and it's a beautiful digital form in the sense that for every photon of light that arrives, you end up recording one count. So you really are seeing the light as it arrives and really recording a completely undistorted image of the object that you're looking at. But in essence, what happens is every time a photon, a particle of light comes in, it liberates one electron within a pixel within one of the elements of this device. Um, and so really you're turning light into charge and then you just need to measure the amount of charge you've recorded and that tells you how much light's arrived and hence how bright the thing was that you were looking at. Um, so the world of fibre optic is, is basically it's a strand of glass 
and the beauty is of strands of glass is that you can actually get light to travel along them even when the strand isn't straight. So you can use light to transfer information around very quickly, obviously at the speed of light, um, but the elegant thing about the fibre optics is that you don't have to have the light travelling in straight lines, it will actually follow the curve of the glass. And physically the way that works is through a process called total internal reflection. Well this is a demonstration of uh, an optical fibre in action. Uh, our fibre isn't a slender gas glass thing, uh, that will be used in communications, rather it's uh, a bent perspex rod, but the principles are just the same. Uh, the light's going to bounce around inside and we're going to send an audio signal uh, through this rod. Now we need a sound source of course and that's provided by the the radio here, a uh, rather old school thing, and the sound comes out of the radio via this cable here into this little piece of circuitry and all that does is it just turns the signal, the sound signal, into a light signal. Essentially you can see a little light emitting diode here and that's producing an amount of light and the amount of light varies depending on how big a voltage or how big the signal is coming out of the radio here. Um, then the light, once we've aligned it, will travel up the optical fibre, our bent perspex rod, going all round. Obviously it isn't straight so it has to bounce off the sides and there's a, something called total internal reflection which is uh, the physics that drives all optical fibres. And if you've ever dived into a swimming pool and looked up at the surface if you look at kind of an oblique angle to the surface, you actually end up seeing a reflection. The light doesn't actually travel through the surface of the water, it actually gets reflected, internally reflected. And the way a fibre optic works is that as the light travels along, every time it hits a side, it basically gets internally reflected. So the light sort of bounces its way down the fibre optic cable. And at the very end here, we have this little goldy looking thing, is a photosensitive diode. And when the light, when we align it, the light will hit that little diode and it'll generate a current uh, and the amount of current uh, is proportional to the amount of light, um, so that's the signal that's recovered back uh, and we can feed that into a pair of speakers here and uh, hear the sound, hopefully, the original sound. So what we'll do is we'll turn up our volume on the speakers, we'll align the diode at this end with the end of the fibre, so the light is now going into the end of the fibre, travelling along, but of course once it reaches this end it isn't yet uh, travelling into our photodiode, and we'll push the diode up to the end there. And if you listen carefully, it's turning on. Ever tried the cabbage diet? And there we go. Stinky. Diet pills? And that's local radio coming through our optical fibre.